My name is Andrew Stotts, and I'll be your host as we continue our journey into the teachings of Dr. W. Edwards Deming. Today, I'm continuing my discussion with David P. Langford, who has devoted his life to applying Dr. Deming's philosophy to education, and he offers us his practical advice for implementation. Today's topic is the best way to motivate. Take it away, David. <laughs> Thank you, Andrew. It's uh, good to be back again. Indeed. So, yeah, uh, I wanted to start uh, actually <clears throat> a whole series on motivation. And uh, in this podcast, we're going to talk a little bit about two different types of motivation and, and, and how people go about motivating people and things like that. But then um, we're going to start a, a five podcast series breaking down the five key elements that I've found over the last 40 years that, that uh, really cause motivation to happen. So in this uh, <clears throat> introduction uh, podcast right now, I want to talk a little bit about motivation. So the topic of that, you know, what's the best way to motivate? Um, you can't. <laughs> so let's kind of get that out Don't of the way. Don't bury the lead, David. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you, can't, you can't really motivate somebody. Um, you can't even motivate your dog to do, do things. You can manipulate your dog to, to get a result. But in the end, your, your, your dog or your child or students in classrooms or your employees or whatever, um, they all have to come to the conclusion, um, you know, that they're, they're motivated to do this job mm. or, their, or whatever that might be. Um, and it, that it's their idea. And so it, it, it's all about creating an intrinsic versus extrinsic motivation environment. And uh, I know this is contrary to all the liter literature that's out there and everything and every motivational guru on the planet that's <clears throat> trying to get you to buy something and is, you know, motivate stuff. And um, I was uh, recalling that I was on an airplane one time and I was sitting next to this guy and, and uh, you know, you strike up a conversation sometimes and, and he said, oh, you know, what do you do? And, so I told him a little bit about what I do and how I help schools to try to <clears throat> transform and get better results in what they do and everything. Oh, that's really interesting. Tell me more about that. And so we did, and we, and we got into the topic of intrinsic motivation versus extrinsic motivation. And I just started talking about, you can't really motivate people with trink trinkets and gimmicks and, and uh, awards and all, and, you know, all kinds of things like that. And we got into a big discussion about uh, trophies and, and uh, sports and, you know, all kinds of things like that. And just as we're starting to land the airplane, I said to him, oh, I said, well, you know, I never got around to, I said, what, what do you do? He says, well, I have a company that makes trophies. <laughs> <laughs> And then it was like dead silence <laughs> while we landed the plane and got off the plane. <laughs> Went your separate ways. Yeah. Uh, he, he, did, he did say, oh, I, I think I understand. But, you know, he's going to keep making his trophies and making money. So, mm, yep. and there's a, there's a lot of money to be made in it, you know, and especially in education. Um, there's just whole catalogs. I get catalogs <laughs> in the mail even today, you know, about all the awards and trophies and everything and how you can motivate kids to do, you know, do this and that. And, and uh, it's, Deming was the first one that kind of took a, a, a board and slapped it up inside of my head and, and just said, you know, st stop it. Hmm. Um, in fact, uh, I remember one of his conferences, somebody asked a question, you know, well, Dr. Deming, you know, I'm in a company that's trying to motivate us with uh, pay and pay for performance and games and gimmicks and, you know, sell so much stuff and you get a free trip to Aruba and, and uh, you know, what do, what do I do? And uh, his response was, well, you can always stop doing something that's stupid. And I, it was just, he had this knack of these phrases that would just cut through to people. Uh, yeah, you can, you can stop it. You can, you can say, okay, I'm not going to participate in that. <laughs> mm. you know, I'm not going to play it. I'm not going to play that game. Right. And uh, <clears throat> so, you know, so what do we do instead? 
And before well, we even get into that, but, what does it mean? What what does motivate mean? Like, as you've used the word manipulate, and you've used the word motivate, can you define? Yeah, well, we we've that's kind of emerged over the last hundred or hundred and fifty years or so as a way to try to get people to do something that basically that you don't think they want to do. <laughs> so whether that's kids learning math or it's an employee, you know, not getting the productivity that you think that they should get. Mm. But basically I'm the leader, I'm the manager, and I want you to do something um, that you're currently not doing. And so I'm going to do something to you to, you know, you'll make you do it, you know. Um, Which we, sounds we like do external, it pressure external, external pressure. External external pressure. We're going to motivate you to do stuff. and typically as what we call extrinsic motivation. I'm going to do something to you <laughs> uh, or I'm going to take something away. Mm. That's really popular in schools. You know, wow, you know, you're going to have to stay in a recess. You're not going to have any recess if you don't get that done or yep. you don't do what I tell you. You're going to be, you're going to be sitting in the hall. So what we're going to do is we're going to, we're going to take away all of your relationships and isolate you. And well, it, that's the same concept we use in prisons, right? <laughs> We isolate people, we put them in confinement, and uh, if you're really bad, then you get into total isolation, right? Mm. You don't even get to talk to any of your other inmates. Well, it's the same depth of um, motivation that is in, in, in schools today all, all over the world. People right. are still using those techniques to try to get people to do something that that uh, they're either not doing or they want them to do, right? So <clears throat> it's really it's really important to figure out well, what do you what do you do instead? You know, if you're going to stop doing something stupid, <laughs> and uh, you know, what are you going to do instead? And that's where dimming really reinforced intrinsic motivation. That your job is to create a situation where people can be intrinsically motivated, that they actually want to do <laughs> the job, right? And, uh, and, and that's a whole different way to look at, you know, what you do, you know, how do I set up a classroom so that kids can be intrinsically motivated? Now, none of these things are, are, are light switch, you know, where you can just switch it on and switch it off, you know, I'm mm. gonna switch on, intrinsic motivation and switch off extrinsic motivation. Um, in fact, if you, with children, if they've been addicted to intrinsic motivation tactics for years, uh, everything from grades to prizes, to awards, to, you know, just little trinkets that they can get stickers, even all kinds of things. It sometimes it, it takes time to, to sort of, wean them off of that over time and, you know, have it, have that, have a less and less meaning. Uh, I'll give you an example, you know, the thing about stickers, you know, I often get elementary teachers say, well, you know, what's wrong with that? You know, if somebody does a good job, I'm going to give them a sticker. Or when I was a child, uh, piano lessons, I got a gold star. And if I, if my, uh, <laughs> did, did a good job in my piano lesson, then the teacher would put a star on it buy it. And um, the, the problem with those things, uh, it's, it's not that it's evil or anything. It's just that you're, you're, you're taking away the emphasis towards working towards the, the thing that you want them to do and, and love and understand. So if the only reason I'm doing this is to try to get a sticker, <laughs> right? You've mm. just reduced the thing that I'm doing to the value of a sticker, right? So there's no real conversation or relationship going on where you're saying, "Hey, man, this, you, you really that you really did a great job on that." How, how does that make you feel? Um, to be able to understand that or explain something, you know, to that degree, you you want to tap into that inner person about um, um that understanding something is probably the greatest motivation, right? I just feel mm -hmm. really good about that. 
um, that's why, you know, we, you get children that when they finally get it, a hard concept of something, they're like, ah, oh, I got it. Yeah. You know, you, you, they're really, um, they're really forward enjoying in, the process too. Yeah. They're really forward in their emotions and they actually put that out. But employees in business, sometimes when there's a breakthrough like that, it's more internal for them, right? They're just like, oh, yeah. Okay. I got, I got this. Mm. I really worked that through. And if you come in and just re reduce it to some type of, of extrinsic motivator, even if I just come in and say, you know, add a boy, you know, good job, you know, well done, Frank. Mm. And then you leave the room, right? And then Frank's sitting there and thinking, I put hours and hours in working through this and going through this. And all I got is good job, Frank, <laughs> and a pat on the back. You're going to get employee of the month, Frank. Yeah. So the message is next time, stupid, don't work so hard, <laughs> right? You can always yeah. stop doing something stupid. Mm. Uh, and Frank learns, you know, just, just do whatever the boss wants. Don't put in any ex extra effort in or, or go through so. Or, <clears throat> but, you know, some people will come back and, and say, you know, well, you know, I like to have more money. And, mm. you know, that's a motivation. And if it's actually not. <laughs> yes, we have to have money to, to survive, but, but the examples are millions of um, people that are making uh, tremendous, amounts, tremendous amounts of money, but they're not motivated to do the job. Right. I mean, we can look at pro athletes, <clears throat> you know, they make millions of dollars and uh, some of them are still not motivated. <laughs> Right. Or when the motivation stops, yeah. money can't reignite it. L no. Let me ask you a question about uh, this from a, let's say a classroom perspective. Let's say I'm a teacher in a classroom and I'm, I'm a piano teacher as an example, and we've got a group of 20 kids and, you know, yeah, there's a few of them that are really into it, you know, and then there's a lot of them that just don't want to do it. David, can I just use the gold stars for those ones <laughs> just to kind of like a like a doggy bone, like, come <laughs> yeah. on over to the piano. What do I do? Or what used to be uh, the norm in Catholic schools. Can't I just whack them on the back of their hands with a ruler yeah. and, yeah. you know, get them to shut up or, or do whatever it is I want them to do. Yeah. Carrot I mean, or stick. You can do those kinds of things, but eventually <laughs> you're going to have to tap into an intrinsic motivation. And, uh, so your example in a class, if I got a few kids that are really into it, whatever it is we're doing or working on or whatever, and they're really working at it, I'd probably give those children a chance to talk about why are they into that? What, why do you like this so much? Or, or why do you like practicing so much if you're learning an instrument? You know, And how do you go about that? What do you do? And, and how do you find a place in your house that's quiet and where you can concentrate if you're trying to read or right? Because what you're trying to do is, is you're trying to use the people that are already self-motivated and to give insights to people that are not self-motivated to try to understand that it's not just because you're just smart, right? Mm. You're probably doing a number of things that are making you be successful, right? And those things could be shared with other people. And it's the same way with employees, instead of just you know, giving an employee the month, I'd probably have somebody that's really doing a great job explain how are they doing that great job, right? What's the process that they're using? How do they go about it? How do they, you know, set up their workspace, whatever it might be, because I want other employees to go, oh, that's what they're doing. I could do that. <laughs> and is that because right? you want them to, to try to explore where is their area that they can bring you know, them so that, okay, you're not going to, you know, I got 20 people in this room and all 20 of them are not going to be piano lovers and virtuosos. So it's not necessarily the process of getting everybody on that piano all the time. It's the process of who are the people who really love it, let them shine, let them share and let other people say, okay, I don't like piano, but I do like working on fixing my neighbor bicycles and people bring bicycles to me every day and I fix them and I just love that feeling or I, I don't know I'm just trying to think about it how would you describe it yeah that's that's uh 
you know, that's, that's right. And that's goes back to Deming's concept of understanding variation, right? That <clears throat> you're going to have variable degrees of performance or ability or whatever it might be. And uh, like, you know, Deming talked about sometimes people are just in the wrong job. <laughs> mm. And maybe you can move them to another job in the same company that, um, you know, that they might like more or they might be more well suited for, or the same thing in school, right? Like what your example of what you were talking about, that somebody's more, much more suited to and enjoy, you know, working on motorcycles versus just, uh, you know, playing the piano or something. But it doesn't mean that they can't uh, reach a minimum level of skill and um, understanding about how to play the piano maybe to the point where they decide, you know, okay, I know I don't want to be doing this. Yeah, 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 <laughs> That's yeah. also motivation, right? Then what, what are, you know, what is your motivation? What do you want to do? Yeah. You know, I get, yeah. uh, it's, in my seminars, I get teachers coming up to me all the time and I always think, oh, well, they're going to ask a complicated question about, uh, you know, you know how, I've got this kid in my class and how do I get him motivated and everything? I'd say probably eight or nine times out of 10, they come up and they want to talk about their child. My son is having, my son is having a problem in this class. How do I get, you know, my daughter can't, you know, get along with her teacher, you know, what, what, you know, what would we do about that? Because that's really, you know, a very personal uh, thing that's going on within them. But then to get them to see that, okay, well, the kinds of things that maybe you're doing in the class are, is demotivating. <laughs> a large number of students, mm. right? Um, it's, it's all kinds of things, uh, you know, there's very variability in uh, you know, time, for instance, right? So if I give a, you, uh, if I give a group of people a complex math problem, right? There's probably somebody in that room that could solve it in a matter of minutes. Right. But there'd be others of us <laughs> that might need a lot of help Mm. Uh, we could probably get to a level of minimum level of solving it or understanding it, you know, given enough time. But the problem is like in schools, we want to truncate the time always, right? Right. You got to get this done the next 10 minutes or you got to get it done by Friday or we don't have this deep understanding of variability and how to manage variation in performance. And so what we do is we make, time rigid but we make learning flexible so basically you learn any old amount you want as long as you get it done by friday because we've made the time <laughs> rigid right and we talked about that earlier about a deadline mm. and right well when you reverse that and you begin to understand how to manage a system and manage the variability of the people in that system right then everybody starts to be more well motivated by themselves internally, which means you, you have to do less and less external motivation, right? You just have people coming in and doing their job and going to work. Same way in like, a company. Yeah. I feel like even just having a discussion with your students or employees about the difference between intrinsic and extrinsic motivation is right there. Something interesting, you know, just to have that discussion. Yeah. You know, I have five children and uh, we started those discussions. My wife and I just got to start those discussions with them when they're two or three years old, <laughs> hmm. you know, <clears throat> I, you're, not, I, you're not doing, you're not doing this to get a suck. If you do this, I'll give you a sucker <laughs> or a lolly, right? No, <laughs> we, we want you to clean up your room <laughs> because that's the right thing to do. Hmm. Right. So maybe I'll come and help you clean up your room and we'll do it together. And, and that, that might be a lot more fun then. And then we can talk about, you know, how can you keep your room clean so you don't fi find yourself in this mess? Because, you know, how do you feel when you have a really messy room? Yep. Yeah, you I'm know, sure, like, Dad, you would have some great tips of, you know, okay, here's the way I would do it in, if I – you know, when I've had this problem and, oh, okay, you know, I didn't even think about that. Like put all my whites in a, you know, pile over there and put all my, you know, dark colors exactly. over there just, just to have it, make a game out of it or something like that. Yeah. And that's, that's totally different than me 
isolating you as punishment and saying your room is dirty, go to your room until that room's cleaned up. Yeah. Right. Um, it's the same thing we talked about earlier. I'm going to extrinsically motivate you to get that done and work mm. that through mm. Mm. versus if I'm going to spend time. And, and part of it is just kids probably really happy that you're there. Yeah. Right. I got a relationship now with somebody mm. and let's, let's work on this together. And yeah. Yeah. I don't want to be time, in my room alone. Yeah. And that's over time. Then let's figure out how do we make sure it always stays cleaned up. Yeah. But you, you have, you, you have to understand the difference between, between a clean room and a dirty room and how, how that makes you feel. Right. <clears throat> And you'll have kids that'll say, I, you know, I had kids that say, well, I, you know, I like a messy like this. Mm -hmm. Really? You couldn't find your book yesterday <laughs> because it was under a pile of clothes. You did, you, you know, you've been wearing dirty clothes to school because your room's stinky. You know, people can smell, yeah. you know, yeah. Right. <clears throat> um, and, it's, and it's not necessarily all just about you is, is how's, how does uh, it affect other people that you're dealing with? Right. Mm. So what, what do you think other family members are thinking about you when your room is a disaster and you're not taking care of yourself and you don't smell good and right. <laughs> right. Um, I want to explain an experience that I had when I was young and maybe you can help, help me understand the extrinsic and the intrinsic aspect of it. Uh, I went to Kent state <laughs> when I was, you know, kind of first starting out. And I didn't really know what I was going to study. I thought I was going to study maybe psychology, but the first professor I had, I was really not impressed. You know, I felt like he just read this book about psychology. And so I was searching and I, I found an economics 101, econ 101. And I went into this classroom and it was huge. There was 200 students in there, hustle bustle. I got in the room. I sat down, the room was divided by a walkway down the middle. So there was a hundred students on one side and a hundred on the other. The teacher came kind of bounding down the stairs and came in front of all of us on that first day. And he said, there's 200 people in this room. A hundred of you will be gone by the time we get to the end of this term. And there will, out of the 100 that will remain, I will give 10 A's. Let's get started. Now that, that guy set a fire it just, I don't know why that I just, I never had somebody say something like that. And all of a sudden, what I started doing is I sat right in the front row and I told myself, I'm going to get an A, I'm going to survive and I'm going to get an A. And then I started to study differently every day after class. I sat down at a cubicle outside the room and I rewrote my notes with the book open and I went through it and everything. And then I would ask the teacher questions either at his office or in the room you know, when I had questions as I was trying to clarify and he sparked a whole new, you know, way of studying for me that, that really carried me through university, but also sparked a fire of wanting to learn and, and the challenge of learning. And I think I've read, I don't know, 3000 to 5,000 books since that day. And he lit a fire in me. And I always tell my students, like, I want to light that fire in you. Now, part of that was extrinsic, and then part of it was intrinsic, but can you tell me what happened to me on that day? <laughs> um, well, it sounds to me like a professor that doesn't know what his job is, right? Yep. His, his job is not just to weed out the bad ones or weed out the ones that <clears throat> are not motivated to learn economics, right? Mm -hmm. He's got 200 students in that class. His job is to produce 200 people who love economics, Right. So <clears throat> Deming talked about that a lot that, you know, so you don't know what your job is, you know, that that's, that's not motivation just to weed out all, all the people that, that uh, don't adapt to the style that I have in the classroom. Right. Right. Yeah. What yeah I mean, with so you? I'm sure that didn't motivate majority of people the way it motivated oh, yeah. me. It worked yeah, for I me. Would, I, I I probably would have got up and up and walked out of that class right then because <laughs> I would have been in the one in the 100 people that aren't going to be there or the, the old thing of look to the right, look to the left. You know, one of those people won't be here. <laughs> it's the end. <clears throat> that's, that's not motivation. That's survival. Right. 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 You're just trying to survive that experience. Now you personally decided the way you're going to survive it is uh, you're, you're going to, 
you're going to work hard and you're going to learn this. But there was probably also a level of intrinsic motivation for economics that got you got that you tapped into, right? My, you realize, hey, I, I really like, I like numbers. <laughs> mm, yeah. And uh, I like working with this and I, I, I'm getting it and I'm, I'm, I understand it. And yep. <clears throat> yeah. So, and, and then you did a number of things. You changed where you were sitting. You changed your attitude. You, you went in and you started working with the professor. Um, yep. So yeah. even though you're in an environment that was hugely extrinsically motivating, <laughs> the, or demotivating, or yeah, demotivating everybody. Depending on which side of the room you're on. <laughs> right. You chose to rise above the situation and, and do something different. And mm. you tapped into your love of economics, which carried on far beyond the class, what you learned in that class, right? Right. Because like you said, I've read, I've read like 3,000 books since then. Well, nobody was telling you to do that, right? Yeah. You weren't getting graded for it. I, you know, I'll, I'll tell you that I never read a book for pleasure until I met Deming. You think of that, my, my master's wow. degree, years of experience working schools. And I, you know, it was always because I was being told to do it or forced to do it or, you know, for a grade or, or whatever it might be. But until I tapped into dimming and intrinsic motivation, that was the first time I thought, I'm, I'm just going to read this book <laughs> for pleasure. And it was, you know, it was the same kind of thing. It was kind of a weird thing that I had to go through because my whole life had been spent on extrinsic motivation. You know, and I guess, and I was one of the ones that excelled in that, right? Mm. I got the grade. I got the grades. I got the scholarships. I got the, I, I got the prizes. The gold stars. Right. right. And when all that ended, then now what? <laughs> well, there was no love of learning there. I had to find a way to, to find that. And that's what you tapped into. Yep. Um, I feel like just in, in wrapping this up, that, that the story that I remember, I've read it, but I also remember Dr. Deming telling it at the seminar when I was there, was the story of the little girl who wanted to make the Halloween <laughs> outfit to be like an angel and her and her mom worked together on this outfit for weeks to get ready to go to the Halloween party. And of course it wasn't beautiful, but it was, you know, handcrafted and they had such a great experience. And then they went to this Halloween party and she was so proud to show it off and all that. And then one of the adults came up with the idea of let's have a competition. Mm -hmm. Let's give a prize to the person that, you know, and in the That's end, the best costume. Course, yeah, <laughs> the best costume. And in the end, and, of course, and we as adults win. are going to pick the criteria for the best costume. <laughs> exactly. And yeah. in the end, she didn't win. She was far down the list. And all of a sudden, she was completely demotivated and realized like they reduced this whole couple of week process down okay. to, you know, something just awful. And I always remember that story. And Part of what I've always said about Dr. Deming is he's a humanist. You know, he cares about how people feel. Yeah, we're, we're really good at creating situations to kill the joy of learning. <laughs> I did so, it right there. That was yeah. a story. Let me, let me review some of the things that you've talked about. I mean, first thing is we're going to be talking about five key elements that cause motivation or, you know, talking about motivation. And one of the things that you said right off the bat is you can't, you can't motivate, you can manipulate and do other things. And I think we're going to learn more about this over time. We talked about intrinsic motivation also being a bit about setting up the right environment for that intrinsic uh, motivation. Talked about extrinsics means giving away something, giving some incentive, a carrot or a stick. And that you're much better off using intrinsic motivation rather than trying to reward people with a gold star, because when you do that, you just reduce it down to some, even, even people who are intrinsically motivated, I mean, can be suckered in to just going after the gold star and or money. <laughs> yeah, or money, right. Definitely. <laughs> And they may even, you know, sabotage the business or whatever to get that gold star or that money. Uh, and then you talked about the, the idea of the, the piano 
thing of when you've got a few students in the room that are really doing well with them, having them talk about why they're, what happened, what, what they like about it, what's going on for them, because maybe it's not going to be that everybody's going to be a, a piano star, but if they could learn the process or share the process of the, of the excitement, that may be able to be applied in other areas too, for some people. And then uh, you talked about uh, understanding variation. And part of it is understanding that not everybody's going to be that star. And I think also uh, the last thing that I, I think about is um, that you, the thing you said is that people may just be in the wrong job too. Like you can't necessarily get the best out of someone sometimes because they're just in the wrong job. And I think that's, that's kind of a, a critical one that we oftentimes overlook. Is there anything else that you'd add to that? Well, I was just thinking about, you know, special needs kids too. You know, I, I was talking about <clears throat> teachers coming to me and wanting to talk about their own child. Yep. They say, oh, my, my, my son has ADD or he can't do this or he can't do that or he's got this thing in, cla in classroom. You know, what do, how do I motivate him <laughs> to do stuff? And, uh, you know, invariably I'll say, you know, does he ever do anything on his own over a long period of time? And invariably they'll say things like, oh, yeah, he loves to make model airplanes and he'll go to his, his room and he'll spend just hours making model airplanes. Well, he doesn't have an ADD problem. He's got a motivation problem, right? Mm. He, you know, he loves doing that, but he doesn't love what's going on at school. <laughs> so, <clears throat> turn the you know, it all depends on the, the kind of an environment that you're going to make. But mm. because we have so many kids that are like your story um, are being demotivated by school, right? Well, what do we do? Well, we're going to classify them. We're going to call these ADD and we're going to call these kids this, and we're going to call this that, and, and then we're going to medicate this group and not medicate that group. And, but nobody's ever saying, how do we change our system? So we have less and less and less of this kind of behavior. So, yeah. And that's what we're going to get to in the next Five uh, podcasts. It reminds me of that ACDC song when I was young, Problem Child. I'm a problem child. We, I've been labeled. I know exactly what I am. Yeah. Well, David, and on I'm behalf proud of, of everyone, I'm proud of it. <laughs> yes, exactly. I've got my spot. On behalf of everyone at the Deming Institute, I want to thank you again for this discussion. For listeners, remember to go to Deming.org to continue your journey. Listeners can also learn more about David at langfordlearning.com. This is your host, Andrew Stotz, and I'll leave you with one of my favorite quotes from Dr. Deming. People are entitled to joy in work. Mm -hmm.